I grew up in my dad's waterfront restaurant, serving people like John Travolta and Walter Cronkite in the summertime. I'd watch my little town swell in June and then vacate by September. I'd then head back to school, riding my bike up the hill past dormant houses. For extra cash as a teenager, I helped yachts prepare for their trip down to the Caribbean. I was hired as delivery crew on a big, beautiful wooden sailboat called White Hawk, as far as Newport. But I wanted to go further. In high school, I took a course on the Vietnam War. In a dark little classroom, a slideshow of images transformed that yearning to travel into a bigger mission. I learned that a fistful of images had ended that war. The burning girl, the spy shot in the head, the piles of dead babies during the My Lai massacre. These atrocities had to be photographed to be believed. What power, even 50 years later, especially 50 years later, a lone committed photographer can alter the course of history. My own relative privilege and apolitical parents had, pr had protected me from a raw dialogue of history. This realization motivated me to become a photojournalist. The history we know is the history we see. Several wars and continents later, that commitment to history still guides me. I approach each story in three tiers. The immediate moment, the story of today, and the story as it should be perceived 50 years from now. I'm writing a book about my time photographing in Iraq, and I've been looking through my entire archive as a visual journal. As I sit at my computer, my four-year-old daughter Beatrice pulls on my arm, asking me to watch Sesame Street with her. On the computer screen, an image of insurgents praying in a bombed-out home in Iraq. Mama, did I go there with you? Was I there? She asks. I want to say, no, sweetheart, you were definitely not there. And you were not there a moment later when that guy pulled a grenade pin on me. And you weren't there when I followed a slippery, thin eight-year-old boy into a sapphire mine in Madagascar. Or when Michelle Obama sat in a sun-soaked room with a dying Nelson Mandela. But instead, I just say, baby, please, just go back to watch your show so that I can finish my work. It's hard to reconcile the me of today with who I was a few years ago. As I look through my images, there are those whose significance has been bleached through time. But there are others, those precious few, who still meet the third most important tier. And that was always the goal. Does this image matter 50 years from now? I covered much of the first three years of the war in Iraq. 2004 was the most significant. It's April. The country's falling apart at the seams. Iraqi Shia, fed up with empty promises, begin to take up arms against the US military. They're liberators just a year before. I'm working for the New Yorker magazine with a writer, and we make forays into a neighborhood slum in the morning when the rhythm of war allows. Mornings are quietest, night's the worst. One morning after heavy fighting, we drive to a morgue. When they start stacking bodies in a refrigerated morgue, you know it's been bad. On this morning, they're stacking them outside. That is very bad. We meet a family picking up the body of their son. He's a martyr, they say. I take some photographs of the coffin, crude plywood, the body thrown in so fast that blood drips through the seams. They strap the coffin to the top of a truck. I take another close-up image of the blood as it had dripped halfway down the windshield, drying midway. I get permission to photograph the funeral, so we follow the truck through empty streets and arrive at a little courtyard. Women spill out of the house, their arms in the air, howling. I turn my attention from the somber work of the men to this unrestrained passion of the women. Grieving is segregated. The men stay outside, and I go with the women and the coffin inside. The lull in fighting is temporary. I know I have mere minutes to work, so my hands start to shake. The power's out. The little window's curtained. I spin the dial on my camera to a slow 20th of a second, calibrating to the darkness. There are more women inside, their black abayas crowding the room, now noxious with the rancid cheese smell of a body. I snap glimpses of white faces. I move to get to a better angle, and I trip over the coffin. I feel nauseous. The women howl louder. It is a primal pain, violent. A woman, start, a woman starts beating her chest, and others follow, their arms flashing in the thin light. 
Another woman tears off her headscarf and begins to beat her hair. Her hair catches and tangles in her fingers, just makes her scream louder, now drowning out gunfire that I hear popping in the distance. I point my camera around the room and land on a boy I hadn't noticed before, crouching at the foot of his brother's coffin, his face to the ceiling, the whites of his eyes blurred with grief. A rumble shakes the house. Several percussive explosions follow. The fighting is getting closer. But I keep my camera on the boy, whose eyes are now blazing with fear. I feel weak. My bones hollow. My camera feels like an anvil. I'm alone in this mission. There's no easy escape from the house. The fighting is nearly on us, and I risk being stuck like this family. That boy is fucked. He experiences this every day. What does that do to a five-year-old kid's psyche? He is the picture I need to make. I work harder. Don't let this be a futile risk, I tell myself. I square my shoulders to him and make four more frames before they pull the coffin away. That boy is either dead, a refugee, or a soldier today. He'd be 18. I wouldn't be able to find him, but I'm still telling his story. It became impossibly dangerous to photograph Iraqi civilians later that year. On another trip, I spent a month trying and nearly dying before I just got on a plane and went home. As I was walking through customs, an editor from Time Magazine asked if I'd get on another plane to Chicago. I'd be photographing an exciting new politician, then State Senator Barack Obama. After witnessing years of failed foreign policy, I'm reluctant to photograph any politician, but I go. A couple of election cycles later, I'm an official White House photographer for President Barack Obama. Some days I photograph the Situation Room, other days his family. One hot day in June, it's Sasha's 10th birthday. The party is around the White House's modest pool, hidden from public view by high hedges. I keep half an eye on the President in case he gets an important call but I notice some of the girls are sneaking out through the hedges. My instinct for history kicks in, and I follow. I pull my lens wide to take in the group of girls in neon bathing suits, having a water balloon fight on the south lawn of the White House. Each girl a different shade, mostly brown, laughing with abandon in front of a home built by slaves. That is an image I will be proud of 50 years from now. My own daughter, Beatrice, is also a shade of lovely brown skin. And the truth is, I was never alone. She was with me, not as my daughter or the thought of having a daughter, but as a then unborn child that would need to know history. Like me, that girl watching the boats leave, or that boy at the foot of his brother's coffin. My daughter reaching her little fingers up to touch those images. Thank you. Mm -hmm.